Hello, this is Simply Exploratory, and today I'm coming to you from historic Fort Loudon. And I'm here at the entrance, not at the actual fort, but we're heading over down for, I believe the event is called Across History, Across the, or Across the History, um, here being held on the weekend of May 20th and 21st. So we'll see what this place has to offer. Let's go. And right here on the side of the road of Route 30 here in Fort Loudon is this marker it says, built in 1756 by provincial government, start of Forbes expedition to take Fort Duquesne in 1758. In 1765, colonists under James Smith forced the withdrawal of a British garrison from the fort. And it has information from the Pennsylvania State Society here of Daughters of the American Colonists below it. So there's a little bit of information of why they built this fort. So we are standing here in front of a recreation of the actual fort right behind me there. And like I said, today they're doing history across time here so they're they're going to be representing different eras of time uh, from uh, early early days so as you can see over there that looks like uh, Vietnam Vietnam probably Korea as well and other periods of time here so, and again, we're at historic Fort Loudon, and we're going to just cruise around, look around, see what's going on. Most most of the uh, reenactors are setting up. There is a historic home that has a museum in it that we're going to check out as well. Um, offhand, I don't know the name right now. I, I mean, I passed right by it, but I forgot the name of the house of who the home belonged to. But hopefully we can look around and, you know, get a pre-look pre at whatever's going to go on today. And this is, again, the weekend of the May 20th and the 21st. Today happens to be the 21st, and it runs from 9 to 3 p.m. today. So by the time you see this, um, unfortunately, I won't be posting it immediately. So, you know, I got quite a backlog here of stuff that I still got to put up. So I probably won't be seeing this till, I'd say, July at least hoping sometime in July. Yeah, we've got 40, 40 couple of units to be able to see here from ancient Greeks and Romans up through modern times. Uh, Vietnam does a wonderful job down behind me here. There's three different units in Vietnam. World War II has a medic, uh, mobile medic unit, the, uh, Pathfinders, a couple different units with World War II. Uh, on up above, there's uh, Germans and Russians uh, on over to Na Napoleonic Wars uh, and just all kinds of good stuff. Oh, wow. So we've got, uh, we got a cannon that goes boom every once in a while, actually a couple of them. Uh, so, and we've got some good, good food at the food trailers. All righty. So help yourself and enjoy. Thank you. So we're going to start off by checking out the, uh, the fort itself. Like again, this is a recreation of what they believe the footprint of Fort Loudon looks like. Yeah. 
So they got their, their different eras they're going to be representing as well. So from I forget exactly from what time period to time period, but we'll see them all as much as we can today. And again, this is the, uh, the fort itself. Wow. It's morning. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is the guard house right here. As garden sentry duty was a daily part of military life on the frontier. In a fort, the guardhouse served as a staging and resting area for soldiers detailed to that duty. Jail cell side was used for confined wrongdoers pending their court martial and punishment. Closes a letter from nephew from Fort Loudon, who was always has always behaved himself without giving offense to any gentleman, I cannot tell what could induce Colonel Stevens to put him in the guardhouse. Oh, wow. And again, remember, this was a provincial uh, fort. Um, they were technically British citizens at the time, not Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania was, this was the, uh, the, um, the wild, shall we say, you know, the West, the unknown frontier. And here's a, representation of a bake oven and it said bread was a staple of the 18th century diet bake oven like this could be found at individual homes as well as fortifications of the Pennsylvania frontier that's the word I'm looking for during Forbes campaign Colonel Bouquet's orders dictated that all stations have bake ovens to provide sustenance to the troops. So I'm going to walk around and kind of give you like a little preview. Wow. And just to get the, I have to get lots of lots of pictures. This one's going to be a lot of pictures because of the historical significances of all these errors they're going to be covering. So I was having a, a nice chat with the uh, ladies here at the gift shop. They were telling me about more about the history of this place and stuff. So right here shows you the restoration that's gone since 2018. by the Fort Lauder Historical Society. So its former condition. And then they came to the rescue and uh, so I believe, I'm not sure if that's a restroom or if, I think this area we're allowed to go in as well. Maybe. Yep. Oh, wow. So again, I'm not a big student of the French and Indian War yet, but I'll learn more. 
I'll um, direct you to the Wandering Woodsman's channel who's doing a series on this very war because this fort was a very important forts that line the, uh, the mountains around here. And there's a uniform. So I guess they use this for something else as well. Get a picture of the sign right here as well. So I'm going to walk down the um, walk down the um, path here, down McCullough Lane here, and see if there's anything going on with the uh, Greek and Romans, and working my way to more modern times. Ah, oh, okay, that's what he was talking about, okay. The Vice President of the organization here was telling me that about the breakfast sandwich, the croissant sandwich that they have here. So they have some vendors. Oh wow, that's what I heard earlier. He was there over there. So I will try to cover at least a little bit of each era. I don't know how much because I only we only have like six hours here to uh, give get a little bit of information. And the cannon is called Dorothy. Can't wait to check that out when it gets fired. It's similar to, if you've seen a Civil War cannon, it'll be similar to that. I wonder if you're, you can shoot the bow here, or is it just a demo? If you're a bow hunter, you can pretty much do this. They're more dressed like medieval times, I guess. So now I'm gonna come down this way. Down McCullough Lane here. I don't know if that looks like it's part of the park itself as well. Karnkachogi. So it has 
the pronunciation. And it's meaning. Oh, wow, cool. So that's the creek that's right behind, beside us here. So here's the uh, Kanakachogi, which means indeed a long way. Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong too. Kanakochigi. Could be Kanakochigi as well. But now we're going to walk down. Here. Now we're going to go back into ancient times. So we're going to work our way around the camps here. We're going to start from this corner and work our way all around. To So this is the Greek phalanx. Beautiful, look at the shields. Look at all those shields, how beautiful they are. Wow, he's got the heavy duty gear. Heavy duty camera. <coughs> and he's holding a spear. Wow, cool. Wow. Showing what their diet was as well. Yep. Wow. It's around 500 BC. <laughs> what you're saying is a group of Greek citizen soldiers. They would not have been trained in a professional manner, but rather called up by the state, where they would pay for their own arms and armor. Oh, wow. They would give battle over a few days, and then they would come back home and tend to their land, their crops, and their family, whatever social uh, obligations they had as well. Um, but it's uh, independent city-states that made up a larger Greece. There was no nation at the time okay. that identified under this, under uh, city-states or kingdoms. Our shields over there, Aspis, they're about 36 inches and they're concave. That's so when we close our ranks, the shield goes from out here and it rests across your chest. As the ranks start to close, you're going to get pressed in what's called the aphismos in the phalanx. And that concave design allows you to breathe and not get asphyxiated. Okay, so how, how long do you uh, think the boy was? About seven to eight feet? Uh, anywhere between seven and eight and a half, my guess. So seven to eight and a half feet were our spear, oh. our spear lengths. Basically, that's about, I think that's, that's probably the size. So that's the dory right there. Yeah, so you can see, that's exactly <laughs> probably the size of many. I forgot what's the armor you're wearing called. Well, there's, there's, there's no 
true name for name it. For I don't know what it was called. Oh. We call it a tube and yolk rubber because the okay. yolk comes over the top. Five okay. Minutes. You don't even know what it's made of. Oh, so either leather or linen. Or okay. mix. Or Someone mix. Someone proposed that, and I think even bronze. Is there a tea place? Yeah. Well, many times you see bronze all over it, so this would be covered sometimes in bronze scale or bronze plate. Okay. Wow. Yeah, or something just to, because you probably saw his armor yesterday, it's just a little plate called cardiophylax. This goes right over the heart. I understand. Yeah, yeah, he has it, I think it's on that. Oh, Matt Durant? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, so to just put that on your armor and you protect that thing. That's wow. an ancient thing. That's the Assyrians, they would put the little plate. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm <laughs> Clean. So that's what most people think about when they think about a Greek soldier, the gentleman back there with that type of helmet. That's what they think of the 300 of most. <laughs> Thank you for your information. Well, they hired the actors. That's a great illustration. I think the problem is that they shot so much for so many photos that editing and most of the stuff has them there. So that's So they're going to be doing demos throughout the day as well, so of different parts of the culture of the phalanx. They're doing a marching drill. I'm sure they probably already did it because it was at 9 o'clock. And then at 11 o'clock, they're doing a Spartan drill demo, kids and volunteers. Then at 1 p.m., they're doing a combat demo. So hopefully I'll be back in time for that to check out the combat demo. So that was interesting to, to hear that they had to purchase every bit of their, equi their equipment. I'm glad you're a photographer. I know. I almost brought my actual camera. I'll be back in five. Yep. Oh, wow. I asked him if that was more comfortable than modern day clothing. Sometimes. Yeah. Wow. Sweet. Look at the different shields. A club. Swords. And of course, what you think about when you think about the Greeks. Wow. That and from my era, there's a lot of little metal bits that survive. It's, it's right at the beginning of the Iron Age and the end of the Bronze Age. So there are, there are bronze weapons and there are iron weapons, often in the same grave, right next to each other. So we're just, we're just starting to make iron. What's that? And now you can get a real history lesson from, from these reenactors. Oh, it, it really varied a lot. Um, 
what time you're talking about. For, for Romulus's time, we don't even know. We know there were, there were war bands running around. Each of the city had its own flesh and warriors who were generally the wealthy men who could afford all the, all the nice weapons and stuff. Film the children. Unfortunately, there ain't gonna be a lot of children around here. There's another one, yeah. That's a Roman shield, but yeah, same shape. Very, very, okay. very definitely related. Um, by the time you get up into the into the actual Roman era, uh, legions of men are anywhere from four thousand to six thousand men, and they have at least two of those each year. When you get into the Roman Empire, legions are about five thousand men, and they've got almost thirty of them full time. So the numbers are going up. <laughs> And a lot of just because there's, there's more people, <laughs> growing population everywhere, all over Europe and everywhere else. Uh, iron had a lot to do with that because with with uh, iron tools, you can more farmers can have good tools. They can have plows. They can raise more crops if they have to plow the ground rather than going around with a stick just poking holes. In What's that? Yes, everything took time back then, and that was that was something else that's hard for us to remember is that everything took time. Everything was made one piece at a time. Uh, every every article of clothing started well, linen would start from harvesting flax, which is a stocky plant. And uh, oh, they yeah, guys. I told them to just take pictures. Okay, yeah. Um, where was I? Yeah, everything takes time. You have, to, you have to get the fibers out of the flax, and you have to spin them into thread, and then you have to warp up a loom, and then weave the cloth, and then make the clothes out of it. Or get the wool from the sheep and make the, make the thread. It says the Italian military system. This. That's a little piece of armor. Sure. Tunics yeah. the force. Where you guys felt it. Kind of cool like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Felt it. Right. Right. Up around your waist. Draw it up above your knees. This is actually real Pull it up above your knees and felt it. Stays. Got all this extra fabric around your waist. Like you say, there's like a pocket almost. Which you can see that. Very much. If I wasn't wearing the armor, I'd have some. Something called the Classy Ventralis, which is another piece of linen that's kind of well, decorated in the same way. Roman footwear. Yes. Hey, Battle Taylor. Was, yeah? Keep an eye on the Greek camp. We'll be right back. Okay. Yeah, they're they're going to go go do stuff in the field. Oh, okay, yeah. So don't uh, make you look guilty. So, yeah, hot nails, so that when we're pushing against each other in the field, we're not slipping. Uh, during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, that actually backfired on the guy. Once you're on, like, cobblestone, where, like, they will also poke holes in your ceiling. Bodily fluids and stuff on the ground. There's a century in Spain that's lost his life the after he was chasing off some rebels, almost a. Uh, Achilles Seems like. to be the ancestor. He slips, the, falls down, they turn around. Uh, we don't have one. Don't there. have a room with you. Um, you saw, uh, and if I'm telling you stuff you already know, it's yeah, okay. I, I don't mind. Oh, you don't mind? Yeah. Uh, do you know about, tell me what you know about the different armor types the Romans used. Uh, let's, let's be done throwing things for now. Chain mail leather armor on the floor. All right, all right, so the leather armor would have been for officers who have worn it all. Okay. All right, so you've got chain mail like this. This is actually a Celtic convention, believe it or not. Um, the Romans adopted it. It changed very little. Like this stuff, the decorations around here changed. But for the most part, this is the same. Um, this shoulder doubling, they kind of copied from the Greeks a little bit. But you see Celts also wearing that shoulder. Stuff as well. Um, they also, you know, the famous segmented steel armor. No, you're fine. More for segmentata. Um, it is what's in all the movies, right? It's in all, even in Roman propaganda, like their statues and all that. 
That's what you see all the time. We love that armor today. The ancient Romans loved that armor. Archaeology tells a little different story. But they use it about as much as they use their other types of armor, but it never took over. Like it never became uniform. Um, it is probably, unless you get it fitted in your measurements, probably the least comfortable armor to wear. Um, I've heard that if you order a custom fit, one, like, oh, you to wear it all day, like a second skin. But I seriously doubt every grunt is getting custom fitted to him. That too, it looked like it was a very expensive armor. Yes, you have a, a guess as to why. Probably the metal. That the, some of them would have been. Um, also because it requires a, a skilled labor to make. Like you need an actual proto armor to make that. Chain mail technically takes longer to make, but the labor is unskilled. So if you're working with an economy of scale, this is actually more economical. It's not as protective, right? It'll stop a stab. It'll stop a cut. But if you hit me, right, that won't cut into my skin, but you might break my ribs. I'm wearing a padded vest underneath this, which helps soften some of the blow, right? But hit me hard enough, it's still gonna break my ribs, it's gonna hurt. The segmentata, on the other hand, won't, right? I could, uh, one of my favorite demonstrations that I figure that if you've got like 20 guys out here, I can always find someone who's willing to put the punch stuff in the gut. They're wearing the seg, and I'll come back with my hand and a little bit. You get them. <laughs> well, I would have felt it a lot more. You know, their hand might I was looking at the wrong way, but. Do you want me to punch him? No. No thanks. <laughs> um, you want to hear more? You start your. You, start uh, you know, I don't think you did no, that. That would have been cool. Cool. Do you want to hear more? Yeah, cool. So, I'm here all day, so. No, good. So, this is. Uh, well, I've done hiking in this gear. Uh, I just recently got a house and I have all sorts of different hobbies. I've been working in the backyard, cutting down the leaves, chopping up doing charcoal while wearing this. It's 20, like, you get this padded vest on, it's 20 pounds. You tighten the, uh, the belt so that carries some of the weight. Um, and it's just like a really heavy sweater. But you keep yourself filled with water, you won't dehydrate. You should work in this all day. Um, like I said, I've also done hiking in this. Uh, you forget it's there. My buddy, the guy you just saw come running in, he probably watched the brief stuff, right? He was wearing that sag. He went on another hiking trip with me. Um, and by the time we got to the top of the mountain, I was all happy to ride. He still had an energy, but uh, he had his arm was chafing all over. He was quite uncomfortable and itching. My, now, I'm moving out of what archaeologists and historians have said. <laughs> actually about the same weight, which blows my mind. That is not included. You wouldn't think that, but one of our guys who has both, he's a retiree, a retired Marine, and then served somewhere else for 20 years for another company. Uh, he's got, so he's got two retirees in him, right? He's got every set of Roman armor there is. He's weighed them all, and he said he was able to wear those. Um, but, like to watch and see what they're doing. They put on some pretty cool demo hikes. I could, I could talk no, about it. I know, I get that. <laughs> Josiah, do you need us to stop to let you catch up or are you just going to fly over us? Okay. Go out further? Okay, great. Will do. He makes some really good documentaries. He can make this uh, photographer come out.
So now we're going to the next era. Let's see what this era is. Morning. Morning. Do you see Dylan on the table? Because I have that, that little, there's a table that goes down there. Uh-huh. It looks like they just sort of carved in enough that that's just flat. Interesting. So it's more like a very, it's a, it's a very low. So, so yeah, I guess yeah, it's, the idea would be it's probably sitting in front of the hell. It's a place to catch the splash of the bowler. Yeah. One interpretation is for drink. That's a popular way to drink. Yeah, but that doesn't sound like a therapy. The whole but if you look at the if you look at the shape of it, and I think it was associated with the sound of the table. Yeah, exactly. in terms of the nature of the table. Um, but it, it has just this little bit of uh, routed indent bowl. Yeah. And that, that would catch the splash of the sun. Yeah, send me the link. I'd like to see it. Yeah, I'll send it. Howdy, howdy. Hello, Mark with the Hannah family. I like how you're dressed. Yeah, it's really shiny. Yeah, including the bowl. Those are pretty cool too, Steve. I thought they were good. Yeah, where'd you get them from? It's not a trick question. But <laughs> yeah, no. There's, there's a, a, an importer where you can buy, if you buy five pairs of shoes for a certain amount of money. Yeah. So people will buy like two pairs for themselves and sell the other two. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, one of those ones. Yeah. But they're straight locks and they have a pretty good bolt. Like box can... code. That's a really sharp looking box code. Yeah, they're like a hard box. You got, you got lumen there? Oh, yeah, I have a. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You've been busy. That's you don't know what's going to do. You don't know what's going to do. You've been busy. Well, it may be. Except your hat. I've seen your hat before. I threw these out. Top of the uh, tent right there. It's horses. Well, this kind of looks like more like medieval times, just by the tents as well. So uh, we're we're representing a, a knight's household uh, in the early 15th century. Okay. Uh, uh, what we have here is uh, uh, we are various uh, components of a knight's household, but the knight is not here with us at current. Uh, he's staying in a he's staying in a home up the up the road. Um, but this is this is his tent. We have it set up, and uh, as part of that, uh, what you see in front of you is like a display of goods uh, that would be owned by people who work uh, as his military uh, folks. Uh, in this case, archers. Uh, archers being like the, the main part of the uh, rabble that would be uh, an army. He may have men at arms with him too, but these are other rich men that would be staying uh, somewhere close by, but not necessarily here in the the, the encampment and. Uh, 
Uh, we have musicians set up on that side and a, uh, a representation of uh, a surgeon that may travel uh, with us if we were uh, possibly heading towards towards some sort of military campaign, but we are not on campaign at this point. Uh, with the, with the gear I have on the table here, we're, we're showing uh, a few items uh, that archers would own. Uh, this gown I have sitting here, you can see, is um, got two colors. Uh, this is the livery of our lord. So uh, you have a, uh, a reddish color on one side and a blue on the other. Uh, and uh, in several uh, known cases of uh, English armies going on uh, campaign, they said attach a, a St. George cross front and back. So the, the livery gown has a St. George cross on the front and the back to, to identify us as Englishmen. Uh, it's hard to tell when everyone's just wearing their basic clothing on a field. What what side is that person on? Okay. Uh, this was a way that the English would identify themselves to other Englishmen uh, on the field. Uh, part of the gear we have here are a couple of small shields known as bucklers that would be used in conjunction with uh, short swords. Uh, I have uh, some mail. I have a full mail shirt here. Uh, this shirt, um, this shirt's been altered a little bit. Uh, it's not just the tube like uh, a lot of mail shirts uh, come. Uh, you can see here, there's a bit of a weird bunch, and you see that the pattern changes quite a bit right here. Uh, this shirt was split down the middle up to about the waist, and a, a triangular gore of uh, mail was put in there so that uh, if you wear the shirt, it gives kind of a V in the front. Uh, but that is enough uh, mail so that you could sit upon a horse and it would uh, allow you to straddle the saddle. Gotcha. Uh, other components that you may have uh, for a person of this class is uh, a small collar of mail. This could be worn in conjunction with uh, uh, several helmet types just as a neck protector. Uh, you may wear it actually with a helmet that has a full drape on it also as like an extra layer of protection. The, uh, and then this is a, this piece is a coif, uh, it is a full head covering. Ah, oh, you look like a Knights Templar. <laughs> well, so that's old technology by this mm. point, right? Oh, really? So it's adapted by the, by the, the archers. Very common, uh, illustration of archers in our time period basically shows this combination, small half helmet over full male drape. And, uh. Uh, worn in conjunction with a padded garment. Sometimes the padded garment is over a male shirt, and even sometimes maybe a breastplate is involved in there. But uh, this helmet combination is seen a lot in the illustrations of our time period. Uh, we also have a, a more interesting piece here, which has got a small bit of speculation on our part. Um, you know, the, the bassinet is a, is, is a, is a, is a kind of helmet that you see uh, it's pretty ubiquitous at this time. The knights are wearing it with uh, skull, uh, like hound skull faces and uh, the various face plates on it. Uh, they have male drapes over theirs. But we see these illustrations. There's, you see them in multiple countries and in multiple books of, of a combination with a, like a, a hard metal piece that is uh, somewhat underneath of the helmet and covering the neck. So uh, this, this piece was you know, based on those illustrations. It's kind of a funny uh, bit, but I'll uh, slide it on as a demonstration for you. Okay. So we see this combination a lot in the, uh, the artwork also. And uh, this is, as far as I've ever seen, the only time somebody's attempted to recreate that from the illustrations. Uh, other groups are now trying uh, some of the other kind of what we call cheap helmets that we see. They're made out of uh, multiple pieces of scale or overlapping circular plates, uh, making, you know, helmet drapes uh, in this shape or that shape that uh, are just made out of multiple small pieces, probably lined in, in leather. Uh, we have one, but I don't have it here with us today, but it, it's funny to see a lot of people trying that style out. Uh, you know, and then a, a, a basic single-handed sword. Uh, as I said, this uh, would be used in conjunction with the buckler. Uh, fighting manuals of the time, you know, show how these items work in conjunction together. You know, 
using using this together kind of gives you a little bit more coverage uh, than you would have with just using the sword without anything in your left hand. Uh, if you had a, a, a longer sword with that you would use both hands on, it, it would give you more of a hip to the top of the head coverage. Well, we don't have that much of a blade, so in this case, this helps protect the lower extremities uh, a little bit and gives you and something to, hand. yeah, and your sword hand, and give you that extra coverage uh, that you're not achieving with the longer blade. Uh, but we commonly see these depicted on uh, archers, you know, wearing a, a sword just hanging from their, their belt with a buckler on the sides. Uh, you know, we've, it's, it's possible that is the uh, idealized depiction of what archers would be wearing in the field, all of this stuff. Uh, sometimes you have written components where it's like, well, a lot of guys had that, and then some of the guys are just, you know, maybe walking around with a, a rope helmet, like it's just made out of a coil of rope that's stitched together, or uh, there's there's a written documentation for like little leather helmets, which I don't even know what use they would really be, uh, but uh, better than nothing. Better than nothing, I think, is the 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 idea there. And then guys who are bareheaded, walking around just a hood on and just their clothes, and Hashita arrows and uh, a bow. Uh, and also over here, I'll, uh, I'll show you the bow we have here. This one's made out of yew. Uh, yew wood being the preferred wood for bows basically all through the Middle Ages. Um, uh, there are bows made of other woods, but this is like, this is considered uh, what people really wanted. And um, uh, you has an interesting property of being uh, looking like a composite without being a composite. It's just that the way the tree grows, it's it's a hardwood on the inside with a sapwood on the exterior, hmm. and I, that's what gives it this two-tone color. The hardwood uh, doesn't like being compressed; wants to go back to straight, so that gives it the bow its power. But when you snap a piece of wood back straight, uh, very violently, it has a chance of breaking, and the the, the sapwood helps prevent it from breaking, which is why this was a, the ideal wood for it. Uh, but we know that bows came in elm and several other species of wood. Uh, the question is, how often did they use those versus did they, they, they use the U? We know the U is preferred in the composite. Hmm. Almost looks like a long bow. Uh, I mean, they just refer to them as bows, but modernly we would say a long bow, just like we wouldn't, they wouldn't say necessarily a short sword or an arming sword in the Middle Ages, but that's what we classify them as today. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're talking about chain mail. Adding the word chain to the word mail is a 19th century thing, where, like, in the Middle Ages, they would just write mail, you know, in their, in their uh, things, or a hauberk, or, uh, you know, there were various names for the cut of a shirt, you know. If it's a, a hauberk is a short sleeve hip length shirt, and, then you would have longer shirts, and sometimes you had uh, just arms, and sometimes you had skirts of mail. Um, they actually had pants of mail too for for suits of armor. And it goes on and on, and they have separate terms for these things. But uh, oh, wow. uh, you know, when they're just generically referring to what we think of as chain mail, mail is mail. the term they use. Thank you. All right, no problem. Our barber surgeon is not here right now. Okay. Uh, when he gets back, I'm sure he'll be happy to talk to you about uh, implements of uh, healing yes, sir. and death. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've been, uh, but my uh, cousin and I have been demonstrating a variety of musical instruments and okay. musical pieces from uh, about the year 1400. So these are all uh, different kinds of musical instruments. Um, these are probably familiar to most most people as uh, recorders. recorders.
And the recorders come in different sizes. So this is a larger size that has a deeper voice. Wind instrument. This is another wind instrument that looks a little bit like a recorder, but it only has three holes. Hmm. Look closely at this. There are only three finger holes, which makes it less flexible. Hey, come in. Come inside. Come inside. I didn't want to no, that's fine. Um, makes it less flexible. With three holes, you'd think you can only play four notes. And you're sort of stuck there. But then you can overblow it. This has only three holes is because you, is so you can play it with one hand, which means you can do something else with the other hand. Oh, okay. Play a drum. Like play a drum. One man band. There's a variety of string instruments here. Um, this drum uh, has a snare on it. It's a snare drum, um, but the snare is made of uh, sheep intestine, which is also what we use for all the string instruments here, like this harp, which will probably sound really terrible right now because I haven't tuned it yet this morning. some of the other string instruments? Yes. So one of the musicians didn't want to be filmed and I I respect that very much so so I should think to ask a little bit more now. So again this is again around medieval times I guess. It's, uh, it's something called bastard feudalism that's in place. So really what it is is contractual agreements for service rather than the old uh, idea of homage and um, pledging fealty to this or that. Right? So you could, you could theoretically say, look, 
the only reason why I was here at this battle is because I had to ride it out by my adventure. I have a question. Is it similar to when we were in the war? Um, the, the, both sides started using a, like a scorched earth policy when it came to warfare. And what the English realized after that was, well, if we kill all the peasants and burn the fields, everybody starves because there's just no food for the winter. So during the War of the Roses, they pretty much let the peasantry alone. So uh, uh, me as a squire, and that's who I portray, squire is a title, it's not a job. So the thing to, to, to think about that is during the, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance period, everybody served a subtlety, right? Even a duke would be the hand servant to the king. Or you could always die of all these roads and not water, something to eat. Right? So there was no stigma against being a servant. Uh, now, what that would functionally mean though is as a squire, I would have people in my, my personal household who were serving me. I would have a cook. I would have uh, maybe a carpenter. You know, people that uh, whose jobs would be to work around the, the place, but if I needed them to fight, come and fight with me. So, um, so the the great lords would have standing armies of soldiers whose real their was that their sole occupation it was just just being soldiers. So predominantly, they left the peasantry alone. Again, and, and the idea of Grow the food, right? Pay your rent, everything good, right? Um, so now we're going to the next station. Let's see. The Twisted Knot. You are. You have arrived. I do have questions about your attire. So some of this was, uh, well, you look like more like Common, right? What, so, what, so, tell me about your outfit. Thank know. you so much for <laughs> calling me Common. Really appreciate it. Say, so, what, what Phil's wearing it's not an would be <laughs> typical of, as you said, a commoner. Yeah, okay. um, you the middle class. Okay. Where I'm the officer, so I'm oh, okay. dressed a little higher in gotcha. station. Not only because I can afford it, but okay. also uh, to mark myself out on the battlefield so he knows who to listen to. Oh, oh okay. Your okay. orders, Captain. Got you. Okay, so that that makes sense. I had I had it. I wouldn't have thought of that. So we also so we have a couple gentlemen over here, as you can see in the uh, red outfits, that are portraying a little bit later in the 17th century. Uh, they would be English regulars that were being garrisoned here in the United States during Bacon's Rebellion. So a little little bit of difference between their garb and ours. Okay. We're, we're a little bit earlier in the, in the 17th gotcha. century. Okay. Yep. Very cool. Yeah, we're we're portraying uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony militia. But there's a different. Uh, they stood up three regiments in 1636, and the Army National Guard uh, chooses that moment as their emphasis. So, like regular Army, 1776, the National Guard in 1636. Okay. Very cool. Awesome. And this is what your camp would look like? Um, typically, a militia would be made up of townsfolk. Um, serving age was between 16 and 60. And in the early colonies, Jamestown, Plymouth, Massachusetts Bay, um, you'd be expected to turn out um, every about every two weeks to the town common. So every almost every town would have a large uh, common grazing area. And you would go out to the common and drill with your weapons, and then have lunch, you'd go back home. But you'd have you know, really the, the story of the citizen soldier starts with the, the English colonies. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Fun fact: I asked.
ting, 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 ting. Everybody's like, the same stuff happens with that. Once you're, once you're flattening out or starts like, progressing to the point, and your projectiles are able to, are able to penetrate that frontal armor, the back plate disappears before the breast plate. Because if you start getting the breast plate slowing down that round that's going through, not enough to keep it from actually penetrating. Once it goes into the torso cavity, it's no longer able to exit out the back. Centrifugal force needs to go somewhere, so somebody's getting bounced around like a BB gun. Like a BB gun into a second. So it's, you're still getting perfectly damaged by having it go through the breastplate and into your body cavity. Yeah, I just I saw your that, back and I was back plate, like, at least you're not getting we're, we're multiple you know, guns into the same round. round. <laughs> so yeah, they, they, that's that's yeah. one of the reasons they stop using your armor like that over in Europe. Uh, yeah, Europe. This, I think this one is a good one. Your American Thomas. Oh. Right? This, uh, you can certainly use that and take it over here. You're done with it. I like that. So if you'd like, I will show you a little bit of pike field here. My daughter is training up to become a pike and this is, yeah. you know, we were talking about the archers and things. This is another type of soldier that is going to take a lot of training, not just to use their weapon and to stay in that formation, which the strength of a pike formation is everyone basically having one brain, doing all the moves and commands at the same time, and keeping that nice straight line. But besides that, I have to get her physically able to carry that pike and wear that arm. And that pike there is short. That one's only about 12 feet. A full length pike in the period would be about 20 feet. So add another 8 feet on the end of that thing, and you get about how long a full length pike should be. Um, pikes like that, that one has kind of a uh, quadrangular point on the end. It's meant to pierce arm. Not really punch through that breast and back plate, but if you see, there's kind of ridges around the shoulders there. The idea is that pike will strike that arm or slide across and be able to bounce over that and into the unprotected shoulder or other parts of the arm. Whereas your leaf plate of pikes, those ridges are meant to stop that from being able to do that. Being shorter, she would also have the leverage to push against that and get that to do that. With your longer pikes, if it gets wedged, it's more likely that pike shaft will snap. Uh, they also in the colonies would cut their pikes down because there's all these wonderful trees here, right? Well, you go stomping through the woods with a 20 foot pike, all you're going to get is lots of pikemen caught up in the trees and probably fist fights break down. I want them to use that aggression on the enemy, not each other. So we would cut those pikes down in an attempt to still make them use the trees. So, being as this is only her second time drilling, we'll see what she remembers from last night when we did this. She's standing in what's called four. So this position is her basic default. You're about to get instructions to go do things. And yes, I have to actually teach them how to stand like this. The, they will be taught with a picture book. All of their postures we call it, all the forms they're going to use. Because reading in the 17th century is, um, well, sometimes more of a suggestion than a reality. She might know a few basic words, but she might not be able to read the full instruction manual. So we give her pictures that she can just emulate what she is seeing. The first command that I'm going to give her that's an actual we are going to go move and do things, man. Is advance your pike. <coughs> She's going to bring that pike straight up. Not bad. Don't go through the first time. But she brings that pike straight up and she carries it in kind of a pocket that she forms in her shoulder. From this position, she can move very regally across the battlefield, but not very quickly. Because if they start moving quickly, that pike becomes unstable, it comes down on the guys in front or behind, and again, I have a fist fight, which I don't really want. Again, I want their aggression on the enemy. So, port, your pike. So she's going to bring that pike forward at a 45 degree angle. This is a preparatory form to engage enemy infantry. Also, a way to get them to move through a port 
Cullis, opening in a defensive wall. She can see the tip of that pipe and she can move it up or down so she doesn't hit the roof or the fortification. Also, moving through trees doesn't get tangled up in the tree. Charge your pipe! So now she's going to bring her pipe down and she's going to take her fist and tuck it up under the chin. So she's protecting her unprotected. Now she's not wearing any armor yet. But if she were wearing armor, her throat and neck is not protected by armor, so she's used her fist to protect that. She's also using her arm to protect the armhole where, they, where there's no armor, because of course she needs to be able to use her arm. It's better to get stabbed in the arm than the necessary bits that are inside your chest cavity. In drill purposes, now this is where she would be engaging enemy infantry. In drill purposes, I would tell her to Lay on! Where's your war cry? <laughs> Lay on! Ha! Lay on! Ha! So in drill, we would instruct them, but on the battlefield, as she's coming in to engage infantry, they would just, as they come close enough, start thrusting forward. And she's sighting down this pike, much like you would a musket, looking for the soft, squishy, unarmored bits of the man she's attacking. Namely the face and the groin. And the groin. Because she's wearing heavy armor and she's maybe marched as much as 30 miles and has to fight at the end of it. She's very angry about this. That battle's keeping her from dinner and she's hungry. So she's attacking any place that she can get that fight. And the groin along your leg, that femoral artery, yeah, you don't want to get stabbed there. That's a very quick way to dispose of damage. Advance your pike. So, that's enemy infantry. But the primary purpose of the pikemen is to protect the mostly unarmored musketeers from cavalry. They're soft and squishy. Those guys on horseback will ride into them with their swords or lances or pistols or carbines and do terrible things to them. We want to prevent that, so they will form basically a human wall, and they will angle those pikes out to prevent cavalry from closing in like that. Order your pike to the closest order. Inside your foot. There you go. So what she's doing is she's bringing the... Initially, she had the pike to the outside of her foot. She's now bringing it down to the inside of her foot because she's going to use her foot as a brace. Charge for horse! So she braces that pike against the back of her foot, leans it out, resting her elbow on her leg, and aiming this pike point straight out at the horse or the rider. Anybody know? Want to take a guess? Correct. That horse is as or more dangerous than the rider, so we want to stop that horse. If that rider gets taken off the horse, that horse is still going to come forward and run her over. We don't want that to be that the horse is scary. One of two things will happen. The first is, that horse rides up here and it sees this sharp metal point aimed at its chest and says, you know what, this guy's really nice to me. He feeds me lots of apples. Not enough to ride and impale myself up on this. And it stops. Suddenly. A horse has four legs, right? It stops twice as fast as a human. What does that rider on its back have working against it? You're going to get some science here. What happens to that guy? He's got inertia, right? So he keeps going because an object in motion tends to remain in motion. And he lands in these nice tendrils of pikes. And there's always some pesky musketeer like that gentleman waiting, oh, that guy, to bash him over the head with their musket. The other thing that's going to happen, so that horse has been so well trained, so disciplined, that its survival instinct is overridden and it crashes into this formation, knocking the pike from her hand. Hopefully that pike has stopped it and she doesn't realize what it's like to be hit by a car going approximately 35 miles an hour. Don't worry, when she does get her armor, if 
that happens, I'll just pull the armor off of her, ha hammer out the dents, and give it to somebody else. But if that horse stops, is she done fighting yet? No. She's going to draw her sword and continue to fight until the enemy is beaten. So those are just the basic commands with the pike. position she's in charge and the enemy comes up behind her all I'm gonna say is charge to the rear your pike she's gonna bring her pike straight up yeah a little more maneuverable than you think isn't it charge to the rear your pike That also works to go other directions. I can have her do left or right the same thing. And then this isn't just one man, this would be an entire block of soldiers can do this. So this is much less cumbersome than you would think. Now, on the march though, advance your bike. I don't want her having to march a long distance this way because like I said, you can move slowly. If you move too fast, things start coming down. So for a longer march, I'm going to have them shoulder the pipe. So now, she can march a long distance. Pretty comfortable. The problem is, now my formation went from being like front and back as close as they can to well, I don't want to get hit by this end. I don't want to get hit by this end. So now my formation has lengthened out. If we are attacked suddenly, it becomes an issue to get these men into that dense formation. I need them. So we're not going to march like this when there's enemy in close proximity. Advance your pike. So this weapon too can be used if you're, we're guarding somebody like our captain here. We're going to have soldiers whose job it is to make sure he doesn't get killed in camp by somebody who doesn't like him. Like maybe a disgruntled soldier who hasn't been paid in a while. But if they're standing there like this for two, three, four hours, that's pretty tiring. I don't want these guys too tired by the end of their shift to have to be able to fight. So they can do something called cheat. So now she can stand there and be on her fight, and she's not getting too fatigued. From this position, I can't do it here or um, there you go, that disgruntled soldier. But from that position, they could very quickly run their pipe straight out and be ready to engage somebody if they had to. This is a holdover if you go next door, they have some of these. This 
the holdovers from earlier times. Um, in this period, I'm using this as a command weapon. So, as the corporal, I would be in the back of the formation, and uh, if she decides she doesn't want to fight and starts breaking ranks, I'm going to convince her otherwise. It's also serving just as a symbol of rank, some, something they can distinguish and see on the battlefield that they can rally to. These two weapons, you know, this weapon is not nearly as versatile, but you can see it's much longer. So this weapon is primarily a thrusting weapon that's going to leave very nasty stab wounds. My weapon is shorter, but a lot more versatile. I can thrust with it, I can chop like an axe, it's got this back point, I can reach down, pull somebody's feet out from under them, and finish them off as I will. So this weapon, while it's much shorter, is a lot more versatile. But when I come against a formation like this, being as I'm shorter, I might be in a little bit of trouble unless I can get in there and catch some of those points and use this like a lever to keep them from being able to strike me. Because like I said, this formation isn't just her. She's in the front rank. Behind her, there's another guy. When they go into charge, that guy's going to bring his pike down like this. He's watching for somebody being sneaky, trying to crawl underneath her. And he says, oh, look at that guy thinks he, oh, that didn't work out so well. And then behind, you would have other guys, as there's casualties, they would be coming down into those positions and closing up. Good? Thank you, guys.